welcome everybody to um, our International Women's Day series where we are interviewing our inspiring or some of our inspiring women um, who are connected to the college or part of the college in some kind of way. And I'm delighted to welcome Professor Fiona McQueen, who is the Vice Chair of the Ayrshire College Board of Management. And she's also the Chief Nursing Officer for Scotland. And Fiona's been in that role since 2015. So welcome Fiona and thank you very much indeed for um, your time um, to talk to us today and really really looking forward to, to hearing what you've got to say. Um, I've also been asking um, some of our nursing students for some questions for you so uh, I'll pop them in throughout the, the chat that we're having this afternoon and we're going to start with one from Sharice Miller who has said can you tell us what inspired you to become a nurse? There's probably a number of things that, that inspired me to become a nurse, but I think the the dominant uh, influence was the fact that I was in hospital as a child. So I had at seven, I had my tonsils and adenoids out. And then um, later on, as a, an, an 11 year old, I had quite major hip surgery. And I never forgot the the kindness and the well-being and the support that nurses gave me. I couldn't articulate it then as a child, mm. but it stayed with me. And I, I was so reliant on, on the nurses for their care and their sympathy and their empathy uh, that that absolutely stayed with me. So the decision for me was either to teach maths or physics or <laughs> to be a nurse. And, and, and I'm not quite sure what um, it pushed me into nursing, but it's certainly uh, not one second have I degraded that decision to tick the box to accept uh, training to be a nurse. Oh, wow, that's, that's, a wonder that's wonderful, isn't it? The influence that your, your young experience has had. So were you always quite an ambitious person as a nurse? Um, did, you, did you choose to sort of pursue uh, this career that would, would get you to where you are today or has that just happened? No, I wouldn't describe myself as ambitious at all. I think for me, it, it, it was about influence and change and where I was knocking up against the system if I wanted to make improvements and it was difficult and people would say, well, oh, it's always been like this. This is how we do things. You can't do that. You can't do this. You've got to do it this way. Um, was a real frustration for me because at that stage, so in the late 70s, early 80s, evidence-based practice was just coming in to the fore. And, and by not you know, looking at the evidence and providing the best possible care for my patients and doing things because traditionally that's how we'd always done them, it, it was quite a challenge and, and, and a frustration for me. So I, I decided I wanted to to be in a position where I could take the take accountability and responsibility and make change. And it, it was never anything I had thought I want to be senior. If I'm being honest, I probably thought I couldn't even have been a, a ward sister, as we call it then, a senior mm -hmm. charge nurse, because these uh, women in that in that time, mainly women, um, were so competent, so capable. I, I I never thought in a million years that I could do that role. So it, it was about wanting to influence, wanting to change, wanting to make things better for our patients, but also for staff as well. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So in your role now, perhaps you could maybe talk a little bit about, you know, what you do, what, what, what does a chief nursing officer do? So it's wide and varied and, and it'll not come to a, a surprise to any of the students that over the last year it has changed quite dramatically. So <laughs> the, the, the chief nurse of a country, country essentially advises government on matters about nursing and midwifery and provides leadership for the profession across the country and and that then in practical terms what does that look like it looks like if the government wants to put legislation through parliament then i laid the legislation that talked about the health and care staffing act so that will be for those of your students who will go on to become registered nurses they will they will hopefully see that and see the benefits of that so advising on legislation that would look at staffing numbers also staff health and well-being and the importance of looking at that because i firmly believe you you cannot provide safe patient care if if your staff don't feel safe and healthy and well themselves so advising on, on perhaps legislation on nursing numbers. So every year the government makes a decision about how many students 
we will appoint into the universities. So throughout the year, we, we do an assessment of, we try to plan in three, four, five, six years time, how many nurses will retire, how many will go on maternity mm -hmm. leave and how many nurses then do we need to bring into the universities to, to train. And, and working with the nurse directors across Scotland about what are the key and fundamental issues. So we created a nursing vision uh, that you know, talked about preparing nurses, supporting nurses, um, planning for the future. Uh, and, and also one of the, the pieces of work I'm very proud of was about widening access into the profession. And that talked particularly about you know, the, the real fundamental importance of college uh, courses that that means that people can come into the profession through our, our colleges and, and that has been really successful. So essentially professional leadership, you know, advising government and this last year in the pandemic, well, all of our lives have been changed. So it became very much um, about safety. You know, how will we get intensive care nurses? How will we get intensive care beds? I was heavily involved in the creation of the Louisa Jordan um, temporary medical facility, as we call it, the, um, for for that. You're looking at PPE. People you know, can't have no, failed to notice that you know, there was a, a, a what do we wear? What's the professional advice about about that? So, why, like like most jobs, like most nursing jobs, wide and varied, but always having you know, people, patients and their families and the profession at the heart of decision making. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's a very good a good uh, way to end that, because my next question to you is um, what is what has been the hardest decision that you've had to make in your career? And, that, and that's from Michelle Cook, one of our nursing students. So I, I think there's many times that <coughs> You make difficult decisions in in your in your career. Um, when it's it's working with patients, uh, sometimes you have to judge uh, when to break bad news and and when to to perhaps wait for a bit longer. If it's um, as a senior nurse, if I'm being entirely honest, that one of the, the hardest thing I think that I used to have to do was look at disciplinary matters of. If, if there had been conduct cases and and staff, you know, had to, I had to make a decision about um, whether someone could stay in their job or not, because that was a, a life changing decision. Another, I did a couple of, again, quite difficult decisions, and that was about entry into nursing. And it was people perhaps who um, had criminal convictions and they, they had been some time ago, but, but the panel who made decisions about um, supporting entry into into the the program um, were unsure and and it would have been easy for me to say no these people should not be allowed in but actually they demonstrated you know good character they had um, you know that the the incidents had happened when they were young and 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 it was a difficult decision to say yes as I said it would have been easy to say no but actually what that's taught me is you know, the opportunity for second chances that mm -hmm. uh, people yeah. um, can have. And, you know, I, I, I watch with pride um, these people who have come through the service and are very professional, high standards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a lovely example. So the World Health Organisation designated 2020 as the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife. And Oh my goodness, the eyes of the world have certainly been on your profession in a way that you would not have anticipated. And under this spotlight, we've all seen the valuable work that nurses and midwives do each day. So I was thinking of you in particular, though, and thinking, you know, what, what's the, the last year been like for you as a person in your role? So it, it's been, like every nurse and midwife, it's been incredibly challenging and I'll talk in a moment about myself, but if we look at our district nurses who've had to have a huge increase in their workload, care for people with COVID-19 who have been dying, and, and therefore the, the, the patients and their families they've had to support, you know, the, the huge increase in deaths and, and tragedies for these families, that, that really takes a toll on, on, on nurses. Mm -hmm. Similarly with those who've been working in intensive care units, um, who've had to support patients 
who normally have their families around about them, but they've not. And the, 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 the nurses there have felt really isolated because they've been in their PPE and normally they can give comfort to the family uh, when patients are dying or patients are really unwell because we've had a huge amount of patients in intensive care who've lived, of course. Mm. Um, and that ha has taken a toll emotionally on, on the staff. So the, the, the work that I've done has not had that personal emotional exposure to illness and, and, and death. So I, I feel a bit of a fluke when I'm saying, oh my goodness, my, my, my last year has been um, turned upside down, but, which it had. So instead of travelling through to Edinburgh to go to work two or three times a week, um, I've, I've been working from home principally, sometimes going through to Edinburgh if I, if I needed to. And, you know, at first, the, in February, March, April, it, it was 18 hours a day, seven days a week, because it, it, it the, 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 the country needed such a, a stand up of so number of intensive care beds. How would we support um, that with additional staff? We had our student nurses going in to take paid placements. So that took a lot of work to make sure we were protecting their education and training. What was the advice going to be? Because you know, there's a lot of clearly anxiety um, within society and within you know, the clinical teams about is this PPE really enough for us? And, and you know, so trying to get the best proper advice that we possibly could on that, and then decisions about you know closing care homes to visitors, closing hospitals to visitors, um, you know, shutting down other healthcare delivery systems, which was really difficult, knowing that people would not have access to some cancer services or um, mm -hmm. other services as well. So. It, it you know, like everyone, life was turned upside down, uh, but a huge pressure on having to make decisions, give advice to ministerial teams, and 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 influence and shape what was happening across across the country from a health point of view, and obviously from a, a nursing point of view. So it, it's been a huge privilege to serve the country, doing that, mm -hmm. providing that advice, mm -hmm. and getting the connection and the feedback from nurses across the country was was really powerful for me in terms of how they were feeling what could help them and so it's it's quite a different year from what we had expected as we stepped <laughs> into <laughs> <laughs> what we thought was going to be a, a, a year of celebration and uh -huh. boy it has been an absolute celebration of just what the profession can do well and um, yeah I'm just going to say that I mean what a showcase I mean it's, it's just been fantastic. And I wanted to know what, what you've learned from this period in your career, but, you know, just from what you've said, goodness me, you must have learned an incredible amount. Um, yes, and I think it's about, you know, team working. Um, nobody can do everything. It's about, I think, trusting the knowledge that you have and not being afraid to speak out. And at, at times people... You know, if, if, if they wanted the economy to open or they wanted schools back or they wanted gyms to open, um, you know, having a confidence to say, well, if you can do that if you like, but people will die. Mm -hmm. And 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 pulling on my professional knowledge and expertise, but actually the network. So what, what is happening across the country, making sure I really listened to the impact that it was having. So I think teamwork, listening, learning, mm -hmm. and not being afraid to admit mistakes and and recognising that you need to expect the unexpected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so now I have a couple of questions from Francoise Crawford. And she says, as CNO, you delayed your retirement to assist the Scottish Government with the outgoing pandemic, which shows amazing commitment. Do you believe enough support has been given to all staff levels with health and social care who went above and beyond during, the, during these unprecedented times? I think that's a, a great question, but it's a really hard one to answer. Um, I talked earlier about the legislation and the, the staffing support and, and how important wellbeing was. And so when I was a nurse director in Ayrshire, I was very privileged to have some amazing colleagues who were really committed to staff care and wellbeing and making sure that there was enough psychological support for staff, uh, making sure that they had reasonable working conditions and, and good working conditions 
And there has been a lot more that the government has done in terms of mental health and well-being. So they've set up a particular mental health and well-being hub for health and social care staff that they can access. And it's www.promise.com. Um, and that has been important. The other thing that we, we're currently doing is that we're looking at research and evidence of the impact that delivering care to people with COVID-19 has had. And we're, we're seeing the, the, the some of the difficulties that nurses in particular are experiencing from psychologically uh, caring for these patients and therefore we're planning to to put in more support for them. Okay. So is, is it ever enough? I'm, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. um, but you know, we are alert to the fact that people need to have that. And even in our discussion about remobilisation of the health service, we're, we're recognising and talking about the fact that people, the staff need time to heal. They, they, mm -hmm. they can't go from you know, going at 100 miles an hour to care for COVID patients to going at 110 miles an hour to get waiting lists down. So waiting lists are important because if you're waiting for a knee replacement and you're in pain, then that's incredibly important for you. Uh, but we have asked so much of staff, you know, I, I, I will be forever in their debt for how they've responded. So as I say, we, we've, we have tried to put support mechanisms in place, even things like extra rest breaks and, and for them. Um, whether it's it's ever going to be enough, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think it's a mark of the profession in terms of how much they have stood up against you know, the, the issues that people have at home, homeschooling, mm -hmm. um, sick relatives to care for, worry about ongoing issues, day-to-day -day issues that we all have in, in our homes that they've, they've done that, but they haven't yeah, been breathtaking. Always, always focusing on the job, but there, there's just the life behind the job as well, the home life, which yeah, which has got a, a, a huge impact. Another question Francoise wanted to know was, um, I think some of her the students on the HNC nursing course um, have not been given an opportunity for placements within care settings and they're perhaps a little worried that this might have an effect on their practical skill set and their confidence moving forward to university. What do you think about that? So that is clearly, that was a big disappointment for me. Um, I, I, I talked earlier about some of our our students last year, our nursing students going into paid placement, so essentially being part of the workforce. Not every student could take that opportunity up. So there were some university students who were disadvantaged by not being able to have a placement. And of course, because we have social distancing we need to have in place, then the whole issue about placements for everybody is up in the air, not just for nursing, but for physiotherapists, people will probably know that there are no dentists graduating this year um, and there'll be no intake next year. So I understand it will be a worry and a concern for our students who are going into, into nursing not to have had that placement. But college students, our students do incredibly well when they go to university. It can be quite daunting at times because you're, you're in college, you, you're in a small class, you know people, uh, and you feel very comfortable with where you are and then you go into university and you're in with 200 other people. Mm -hmm. Hopefully some of our, our college students will know each other and have that support. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be daunting and I know and understand that. But we are putting support mechanisms in place. So the, the, the nurses who will be supervising the students in wards and departments will know that they've they've not had although they're HNC students you you know, think of the the clinical skills you've learned in college but also the academic skills you've learned and the knowledge the increased knowledge base you have and like everybody so we have school leavers going into nursing we have uh, you know mature students perhaps in their forties going into nursing who are not going through college and they they equally they have not had a placement so that that first day I, if I'm being honest I absolutely remember my own first day in placement um, in 1978 <laughs> uh, and the the butterflies and the nerves in your tummy I, I, I'm quite sure will still be here over oh, 40 years absolutely. later, but th they will get support uh, and in no time you'll feel like that you've been doing it all your life. So please don't worry. <laughs> oh, that's that's really reassuring. And yeah, I think some things just don't change in time, surely don't. Um, 
As a nurse, I imagine you will have experienced many traumatic events that, that would likely stay with you forever. Um, so over the years, you must have developed a lot of coping mechanisms. So what, what tips can you give us for, for coping with, with life as a nurse? So things have changed a lot over the last 40 years and I've talked already about some of the support that's in place. Um, when I was a young student, it, it was very much, um, you know, don't take your work home with you, uh, you know, stiff upper lip and and that, that was not right and it was not good. It's impossible not to take your work home with you if you've left a, you know, a patient who's dying or uh, someone who's really unwell or you've and you're both worried about them but you're also worried about your colleagues who you've maybe left and and, and you know that they've got additional work to do um there are many opportunities now for health and well-being and i think it's really important that people look after themselves so within university they will talk and you'll be taught about self-care about the importance of of health and well-being uh, within in the NHS we we know and recognize that so I think for me uh, walking exercise has has been always been a great I mean I have to say I am one of the many in COVID lockdown who have I'm afraid you know, put on the pounds haven't exercised as much <laughs> as I would have liked um, however you know there's a way you know that can be tackled so I think for me exercise uh, and if I'm being honest at, at this late age uh, meditation mm -hmm. um, has has helped me trying to be present and mm -hmm. and recognizing that you just need to be your very best you can be and put any worries you have in your worry box so i think mm -hmm. exercise meditation mm -hmm. mindfulness um ha has all helped as well as having the opportunity to talk so you mm -hmm. talk to your colleagues tell people do not bottle anything up because there'll not be one feeling of either inadequacy or worry uh, that you don't feel that that, that people haven't uh, felt already. So don't be afraid to speak out, look for help. There are lots of places within the, the system, the chaplaincy services, staff care, and actually just having a good old natter with your friends can sometimes do the job for you. But Absolutely. you know, it, we demand so much of nurses mm -hmm. when they're caring for patients that we recognise. And that was part of the vision as well, the health and wellbeing of, of staff. Um, is incredibly important and whether it's in terms of making sure you manage your own home life with your work life um, as well as looking after your physical and mental health you know, we, we absolutely cannot um, overstate the the need to to do that so that's for me exercise mm -hmm. meditation mindfulness um the odd bit of chocolate doesn't go i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure that's entirely the wrong answer <laughs> I think it's a very good answer. Great advice. <laughs> so although this is International Women's Day and we're obviously celebrating the success of women today, we should say that in nursing and midwifery, there are so many men in, in, in these careers too, having very successful careers. So how do you think we can encourage more men in to the care roles just to challenge this gender imbalance? Yeah, I, I, I think, and it's within the, the Nursing Vision, 20, the 2030 Nursing Vision, is that whole about equality. So if we're truly going to look after the people of Scotland, and boy, we've just seen how well uh, nurses look after the people of Scotland, then we need to be representative of of Scottish society. So about 50-50 men and women, uh, you know, people from black and minority ethnic communities as well. So there's, there's lots we need to do in terms of equality. Some international studies suggest that no matter how hard you try, <laughs> you're not going to get more men into caring professions. But I, th I think we, we have seen an increase in, in applications from men which this year, which is good, because mm -hmm. I do think that whole gender balance is important to be able to provide care uh, for, for people. And I think showcasing you know, the role of men in nursing as being careful that they don't then leapfrog over women in terms of having senior posts. Uh, and so therefore, you know, working conditions, flexible working is, is important for both genders so that we can truly um, reflect the, the best of Scottish society within our profession. Mm -hmm. And it, sort of continuing along with that in the quality theme, whether you're, whether you're male or whether you're female, you're going to have to have some kind of um, need for, for a flexible kind of career. 
to to manage your own caring at home, whether that's children or or, or elderly parents or or whatever. Um, how does nursing measure up in terms of being at a job with that degree of flexibility? Oh my goodness, there, I don't think there can be a job that is more flexible. It, it is one that gives people huge personal satisfaction. So you never question the value of the, the role that you have within society, whether it's within prisons, within a GP practice, a care home, intensive care, out vaccinating, as we're seeing just now. Um, there is no question about the value of our nurses and midwives in Scotland. I think the flexibility um, is is incredibly important. I, I would say, um, you know, when people talk about oh, term time working or part time working is quite difficult to manage. And and what I say to people is, close your eyes, think of a health service without parents, and we don't have a health service. Now, whether that's fathers or mothers, <laughs> it doesn't matter. So I think the opportunity to have part time, full time, night shift, day shift, um, Monday to Friday. It is there and I, I would really encourage people into nursing because it's a marvellous profession but actually being able to have although, although I've talked about the inordinate pressures that are, are on nurses you actually mm -hmm. can have a, a, an amazing work-life balance and I would encourage people not to to be afraid of that not to say oh well I, how am I going to look after my old my own parents and and manage children as well well you know we we would support people to work flexi flexibly. We've got great policies within the NHS in terms of flexible working. And I think that's incredibly important that we support people to do that, because actually, you know, once the children are up a bit, then our nurses come back to us and work at you know, many more hours, um, mm -hmm. full time hours. So it's a great profession to join, leave, work flexibly mm -hmm. and, of course, continues in CPD as well. Um, mm -hmm keeps people up to date. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, now, I'm not really sure what the age demographics are for the nursing profession, but I would imagine there's, you know, a lot of young people in school just about to leave and, and, and you know, looking forward to a career in, in, in nursing or, or another of the health professions. So what is the kind of best advice you would give your younger self, you know, that would, that would serve them to? So I, I think it's to to follow your your heart in terms of what what you want to do. Have confidence in your own decisions. Um, I think young people can often uh, overthink and be worried and 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 try not to worry about about the, the future. Um, if you're worried about how you will cope with you know, a certain aspect of the profession or the studying or the hours, then Take a confidence to know that we are the biggest occupational group in, in Scotland and therefore if if people like I can do it in terms of uh, and, and others then then you can too uh, and it's something so my daughter became a nurse and I'm incredibly proud of that and the advice I gave to her was if, and, and you can imagine within our house was that well, she didn't actually want to follow her mother's footsteps <laughs> and she did try uh, another course first but then um, left and came into nursing and she has never regretted it so follow your heart um, put your fears to one side and have confidence in yourself but also in your lecturers whether it's at college or at university to because they're incredibly skilled and they'll support and encourage and egg you on so that you can be the very best person you can be. Oh well, that's brilliant we'll be inspired by that for sure. So now um, a few more questions but just about the future now and um, so often from challenging times comes growth and change so how has 2020 shared a uh, sorry changed your outlook for the future well if if i needed more confidence in the future and i'm not sure that i ever did because i've always been confident in the future i, th I think it's it's given me that i think the the young people in society i believe have been disproportionately affected by the what, what has happened in the pandemic i, I recognize that we've had a lot of deaths amongst older people um, and, and that clearly is a tragedy. But if we look at the restrictions that young people have had, whether it's been their education, their socialising, their, their ability to, to be with family and, and uh, to be out and about, that, that has been huge. So I'm incredibly hopeful that once we have lockdown lifted and we can get back to normal, that our young people can thrive, uh, whether it's within their own personal sphere, within their families, within 
uh, work and within education. And, and I think what this last year has taught us, you know, I, I, th I think we were probably all the same, but even me at the heart of government last a year ago in February did not believe we would go into lockdown. You know, mm -hmm. we as a country, we we were not. Although we had planned for a pandemic of of sorts, we we had not really seriously thought we would have to stay in our houses for a year. We would um, mm -hmm. you know, be be closing shops and mm -hmm. and restaurants and gyms. So, mm -hmm. I think we've shown how flexible we can be, and therefore it will help. I think the future to reduce barriers and, and move forwards, whether it's in, in business or in creating. So if you look at how nurses they use a lot of now video conferencing consultations mm -hmm. uh, and some of the education we've had on, on Teams or Zoom, there's been a lot of CPD done with that. So I think we will embrace the, the good things that have happened. There have been some issues that worry me about inequalities. So that bothers me in terms of of people perhaps who are a bit more disadvantaged. And I think we absolutely need to embrace that. What the pandemic has, I think, highlighted is some of our structural inequalities in society. And I think we owe it to these people and society to try and change that. And of course, I believe the college sector has a fundamental role and is just placed quite nicely to help move forwards. Wonderful. So I've got a question now from um, Michelle Harvey, who is asking about in the future for nurses and healthcare staff, will there be any specific training for dealing with things like pandemics, disasters, terrorist attacks, earthquakes, all that kind of thing, which I think, which I think is a really interesting question. So that's a good question, a really interesting one, and it's something that the government um, is being asked about. Uh, in terms of was our preparation enough and what did we do? And what we tend to, to do within our a &E departments, for instance, we do tend to rehearse. So, but we Ooh. tend to look at car crashes or, mm -hmm. and, and you know, along with other public sector, perhaps police or fire. So we, we, look, we look at that. Mm -hmm. We do again have um, rehearsals of uh, so our public health teams will sometimes nationally um, have uh, a, an, an operation where they, they look at the practice and I think it was Operation Silver Swan was the last one which was a UK one and that um, rehearsed a, a flu pandemic in terms of you know, what we do and what we learn from it so mm -hmm. I think the individual practitioners that we train through unit colleges and universities that you're your nursing skills will be your nursing skills, but I think the organisation's response in terms of having enough PPE, how do you very quickly you know, change intensive care beds to normal beds or normal beds to intensive care beds, that is something that um, organisations do, they, they practice and they rehearse and they drill for that. Um, and, and that will continue and, and I think there's been lessons to be learned from this pandemic in terms of Mm -hmm. how we managed and hopefully I think we've only had about three over the last century but you know again one of the learning things is well we weren't expecting a coronavirus so we were expecting a flu pandemic and the coronaviruses behave slightly differently so I think we will be building that into the future so individual practitioners mm -hmm. will continue to to have their education the way but I think organizations will probably um, prepare more for, for that, but we do already prepare for disasters, uh, albeit in a smaller scale and an ongoing basis. Okay, great. Um, now, we know that this year there's been a massive increase from those applying for um, to be a nurse or a midwife at university. So my question is, will there be more spaces made available at university to help tackle the shortage of, of nurses that you may be expecting? So this is that's a good a good question, but it's quite a tricky question. I've already talked about the fact that um, we do on an ongoing basis monitor uh, retirals, people mm -hmm. going maternity leave, and and how many nurses therefore do we think we'll need? And over the last eight years, we've increased the number of places every year uh, for the number of nurses. And that um, is the cabinet secretary will make a decision shortly on on how many places that we'll need next year. And one of the, the real challenges we've had this year is determining 
um, you know, will people perhaps leave earlier than they thought they would? So we've we've, we've had people have talked about the ageing workforce. We have had a big bulge of staff like myself who've reached a certain age who will be retiring and we've increased our, our, our places um, over the years to compensate for that. So I, I would I think it would be likely that we would increase the number of places again this year uh, so that we, we can continue. But clearly, we don't want to overproduce. No. Because I think one of the attractions of coming into a, a job like nursing is you know you'll get a job. Yeah. Um, right. And we did have maybe about 10 years ago or more, we, ha we did have unemployed nurses. And that's not good for the profession because then people say, actually, I'm I'm not going to go into nursing, I'm going to go and do something else, and that's a great loss. So, mm -hmm. things and roundabouts, we, we do try as best, very best we can uh, to, to look, but sometimes it's difficult to predict. Will more people work part-time? Will more people work full-time? Uh, and it's it's an art rather than a science. Uh -huh, yeah, that must be really challenging, I must admit. So, um, there's one specific question here from um, a student called Nicole Green, and she wants to know why you have so many so few mental health nurse spaces at university. So that's interesting, Nicole has, has raised that. We, we It tends to be the, the programme that we struggle to fill most mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in terms of, of that. And again, we have increased year on year the numbers. And, and what, what we do is we, we look at the number of nurses the service tell us they need. Mm -hmm. We then look at how many we think will retire and then we think how many will we uh, in new investment from government and then we, we come to a decision about numbers. So, for instance, over the last couple of years, we've had additional 500, not all nurses, but mental health workers. And, you know, many of these have been nurses and we've increased the number of um, nurses, uh, mental health nurse placements there as well. So we, we try to to balance it so that we, we're getting enough, the, the nurses who qualify will have jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and clearly that there are many, many more what we call adult nurses, but general nurses than we have with, uh, than, than mental health nurses. And that's how we, we make these numbers. We certainly are considering, you know, the impact on not just the, the profession, but also society, the impact on, on people's mental health post pandemic. And, and therefore that was likely to be factored into the numbers that we'll see. OK. Um, now, obviously, to get into nursing, you know, you, you, you do go to university, but there are other routes into nursing, one of which is through college. We're just about to launch um, a national campaign called Choose College. Um, to raise awareness that this is a, a very viable route to, to start many careers. But um, obviously we're talking about nursing and midwifery today. So why do you think college is a, is a good way to start your career? I think our, our college sector does an amazing job in terms of supporting not just young people, but people of all ages into, into further education, higher education. And I think what it does is it gives you that education in a more supported way. Now, universities support students very, very well as well. Uh, some university courses may only have about 30 or 40 student nurses on them, but a lot. And if I'm thinking locally of UWS, then mm. um, it, it would be you know hundreds. So you could be in a lecture theatre of 200 people. And, and some people really get a buzz out of that and love it, whereas others are a bit more thoughtful. So I think um, whether you're ac academically gifted or whether, uh, like most of us, you, you maybe struggle academically, college is ideal because it gives you the, the safe space to work within a small group of people with support from your lecturers uh, to take you through uh, what essentially is first year of nurse education. And... It, it's it's a great opportunity to give you that start in the safe environment. And whilst I would want everybody who are doing the HNC to come into nursing, uh, what it does also do is it gives you choice. So if you're not quite sure, then you're not committing yourself to going into university for a year. It also mm -hmm. gives you the flexibility. Would you want to go into social care, uh, which is a great career as well? 
um, and it, it just gives you a bit more time to reflect, a bit more space uh, so that you can be confident you're making the right choice. But either way, there is no doubt that college is an amazing start for uh, people going into health and social care, but particularly nursing. Okay, great, thank you. And finally, I'd be delighted to know my last question is, um, what's your message to our students who are starting out in their careers in nursing and midwifery? So thank you so much for choosing. Uh, <laughs> you will, uh, there, there may be many times when you are, are frustrated and and wish that you weren't working a, a Friday night shift and wow. you could be with your family and with your loved ones. But the years of satisfaction of knowing the huge difference that you're making to people's lives is, is truly wonderful. So my message is one of thanks, uh, but one of a uh, real encouragement and joy that you will have. And you have to go in with an open mind. So go in, learn as, you know, as much as you possibly can. Um, in every area, whether it's within a student placement or as a, a qualified nurse, because I hear sometimes students say, well, I'll never learn anything there or that's not for me. Well, boy, you can learn anything anywhere and you will be all the richer for it. And I wish them well. Oh, that's just wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I could talk to you all afternoon. You're just such an interesting person to listen to. Um, he's got such a lovely, engaging manner, and I think if anybody is is leading the representation of the nursing profession, then they have, you know, it should be you. you you're in perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and we are we were delighted to, to to listen to you this afternoon, and I'm sure our students and indeed anyone else who's interested in getting into to this profession will have enjoyed your interview. So thank you, Fiona, for your time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me. Thank you.